thank you, Nikki, for joining us tonight. And I'd like to acknowledge you for the amazing person that you are and the, the wealth of knowledge that you have across so many diverse sectors. And we look forward to having a conversation with you tonight. And as we go on, like every every conversation we have with a guest on here, feel free as members of the, of the network to ask questions along the way. And we, we like to have it interactive rather than JB and I just leading it. But apart from that, we'll hand over to you, Nikki, and thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it, it I've been floored that I've gotten asked. Anyone who knows me and I've mentioned it, I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. I, I felt a little bit misty-eyed about it, to be honest. Um, I was like, oh, I'm very chuffed. Um, I am very much aware that as a female and a very, uh, very female female that are stepping into male spaces, I am a guest. I always use the phrase, I'm a guest in your house, and my opinion is invited. I don't share my opinion um, unless I'm invited to. Uh, I, I don't necessarily believe in unsolicited advice for uh, uh, men about men's issues because I'm, I'm not a man, so I can only speak from my lens and other men's voices that they, you know, they've shared with me. So I really, really applaud and honoured that I get invited into these spaces. So thank you all very much for having me. It's an absolute honour. It's, yeah, it's great. It's great to have you here, Nikki. And just wondering if we can we can start tonight. If you can just give us a bit of a background, like who are you? Like where where do you come from? And what's what's sort of brought you into the world of of suicide prevention and and to have that lens on male on the, the male perspective? Yeah. So I just got Cotton Eye Joe stuck in my head because she just said, "Where did you come from?" Um. So thanks for that, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to try and ignore that while I answer that question. And and you'll, um, you'll notice throughout tonight that Nikki is one who has a great sense of humor. Yeah, I I am reigning in some jokes um, until we become a bit more friendly with each other and they land. Um. But yeah, so I I unfortunately um was bereaved by suicide quite young um my 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 beautiful brother Andrew passed away by suicide when I was around 10 years of age and it it was dealt with in the way for the early 2000s that was very normative you know I was originally told he passed away in an accident or by accident and the way I found out about his suicide was snooping because I was a very curious child I always want to know the why and the how of everything um, I blame my beautiful uncle for teaching me how to install PowerPoints at about two to three years of age, just this crazy, curious mind. And it was really unfathomable to my child mind. Why would we hide a cause of death? Like, why is it so shameful? But the more I learned about his life as I got older, the more I realized it's not simple. It's not just a cause of death. It, it, it has a lot of complexity in it. And so, but that really set, my need to know that everyone's okay off but particularly for a male lens because it was a male that I lost and so throughout when I got into my high school career which was only about 18 months to two years after his passing I just involved myself in a lot of up and coming little programs we were doing so my my main one is this this peer support program that my school created which was peers helping peers which in now this day and age I'm like yeah it's like peer support original style um and it was very focused on students who consented and were involved with the school psychologist shout out to Darren Stocks he was our school psychologist at the time and he was an incredible practitioner with us kids who'd go into this peer support program where you would do things you know outside of of the counseling room you would go and and have this we had this kind of saying that it's not about the saying or the talking it's just that you each know that you've got stuff going on so you would spend time with each other and it just really started to cement my whole, I just want people to have a place to go and to just exist and talk and connect no matter what's going on. It just so happens that I have quite a male dominated family. And so my socialization traits back in those days were quite male dominated. I played cricket. I was really into cars. I liked emo pop punk music and rock music, which I still like today, but you know, really stuff that was typically boy stuff and so it just kind of set that for me and then I fell into uni um by accident and I started down a journey that just 
started to focus in then the uh, research that we were doing while I was at uni was focused on it people in incarceration which is at a higher rate for men and in the state I was in and so I ended up studying men and then it just kept happening um, and unfortunately throughout this whole timeline I was getting more lived experience of male suicide I lost we lost three three males in high school to suicide. Um, one of them I was quite close to and has just absolutely informed a lot of the decisions I have made around my interventions with youth and working with young men um, and the, the high suicidality in my male friends. And it was never talked about. Us girls, you know, would break down and would have these big emotional fits, whereas the boys were just silent. They would, you wouldn't know unless, they let it slip or they wrote a very telling song or they punched on on the footy field or something, you know, went wrong. I spent most of my career being behind the scenes a little bit for a while there. I did a lot of research, did a lot of tabletop advocacy, as I call it. So, you know, um, advocating for those who are incarcerated, people call you and you call and, and that sort of stuff. It wasn't until I moved to Tassie um, and really centred myself that I really got forward facing and started to do a lot of the stuff that I had I had learnt, which brought us to COVID, which accelerated my knowledge of male mental health afflictions. As everybody knows, COVID was a very hard time. If you worked in first response or the health sector in particular, we had people graduating early, being forced, like they were given the option to graduate early, people putting very new, fresh, green people, including myself, out into environments early to to fill the voids that were happening because of COVID. And unfortunately, that did take a big toll on people's mental health and we did have an increased number of suicide and suicidality and because of that that really cemented my drive that things need to stop being so I didn't check if we can swear on this but shit um, right things need to just it, it just needs to cut the crap really um we have quite preventable suicides and we're not doing enough and when and this is affecting men a lot and it, it needs to stop and so yeah so since then in the last three or so years I've been massively dedicated to suicide prevention exclusively um versus being kind of across a whole bunch of male issues from health mental health housing parenting family and all of that um because it, it all as we know it intersects and it can end up with us having high rates of male uh, suicidality and suicide and I just don't want it I have a pretty um uh possessive as that saying that is stop killing my men um which is what I tend to say when I get really angry about it because just like us women are your women you're our men too we all live in this world we're all each other's people I really I need it to stop um I think I am only 30 I have lost too many people to suicide if I if I list them all or have nearly lost people to suicide or I have seen direct actions that could have led somebody to go down that path and it's all preventable and it's all stoppable. And I think it's nonsense that in 30 years I've had that and we have people that are twice my age who've had twice as much and still it hasn't changed. So enough is enough. I agree. Enough definitely is enough. I just want to take a step back. You, you mentioned about your brother Andrew like died by suicide when you were 10. And then you sort of spoke about this transition phase into school, into high school, and you had this natural natural tendency to, to lean towards peer support. And as that's progressed throughout your schooling aspects, I'm just wondering what, what was the biggest lesson that you learned like along that journey about, about men and potentially about like communication and things like that? What, what have you learned through that phase? Um, I'm going to premise this with the type of lads I work with are a little bit stereotypical. Um, so our communication style, similar to mine, is that we do stuff. We don't necessarily communicate with words. Um, my beautiful father has a lovely thing he does with me and he'll be like, do you want a beer? Now, I don't drink beer, but that's his way of going, I got you. You've got a lot on. I see you. Um, we have... Uh, in peer support, it was more around the like, do you want to do this activity with me? I'm not necessarily going to talk. I'm not going to sit down and, and really delve into things, but I don't want to be alone. And I might let slip a few lines here and there about what's going on, but I want to do things. I want to feel like I have this control. And I also just want to feel accepted. 
And so I think my biggest thing that I learned formatively is don't put men in an office. Let's do stuff, hang out, and things will happen naturally if you're receptive and open mm-hmm. to the variety of communication that can come about. And then that that's that's a beautiful message to 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 sum up like a large proportion of male population. I'm just wondering, like I know that you've you're quite modest in in your your resume, but I know you've had had an ability to connect with a lot of people and help people to also have conversations. What's that been like in terms of your journey through an exposure around male suicide? What's it been like for you to to take people on a journey and help them to to communicate? Incredibly frustrating, but in a good way. <laughs> Right. So it's like if anybody has any sport, if we can we just like can anyone just like raise their hand if they've ever tried a sport, including esport, I mean everything from chess to endurance running. Yeah. And you you wanna you wanna level up and you're frustrated, but it's good because you're like, I'm gonna get there. It's like that. Um, but with a lot less Gatorade um and sore thumbs if it's an esport. Um and so it, yeah, it's really frustrating, but in a good way. Um and I my favorite part of the frustration is language. So I my cohort of men that I'm I'm professionally used to working with are very traumatized men. They've been incarcerated, they're victims of, you know, sex abuse and assault. You know, they're very, very traumatized. And they from a young age as well. And so their uh, ability to create um context and concepts for people to you know relate to how we share our feelings is not always there and so they we have to create them for them and a a one that has a favorable memory that's got me into a bit of a trouble is um the this phrase called the white man which is this and I've had clients draw it and it's beautiful and express it that it's this evil system that has oppressed them it's men that's hurt men it's you know all of this um articulation of harm that we all know but using a phrase that is also quite offensive if you take that to a different population of people right and so it's been very interesting to watch this and be a part of bridging gaps between um colloquial phrases like that that have very different but very emotive responses and I think that comes about as well with you say male suicide. Um, and I think it also shows in a lot of the other debates that we have, you know, particularly around violence or, or behaviour that we want to see eradicated. People yeah. start to get a bit up in arms about it. So it's very interesting. Because you can be a very fiery, passionate person myself. It's very, and learns a lot. Yeah. Thanks, Nikki. Um, just got a quick Hi, question here, John. Sorry, you got to leave. We'll catch you yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I got to go. I'm, I'll be uh, really interested to watch the recording. So, uh, see you guys. Sorry. Thanks, John. Great to see you. Yeah, yeah, you. Bye. Um, so maybe before we go to our next question, Bob, you got to got your hand up there. Yeah, if you can um, let me have the talking stick for a couple of minutes. Um, um, Just, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Nikki, are you married? <laughs> no, um, uh, no, I'm not. But thank you for asking. I think. <laughs> but what I would like to quickly share is my one of my um, life principles is keep it simple, sovereign. And mm. I have stood on the threshold of suicide many times since my first incidents of anxiety and depression back in 1984. And this is my simple understanding of what caused that to happen. Now, within my heart, within my inner knowing, there is a knowing of what it means to be human Mm. and to live as a human in, you know, um, unconditional love, if you like. Mm. But through my life, the programs that I took on board that developed my beliefs and my modus operandi were taking me so far away from my centered core of humanness, that there came a time when my body just went <laughs> and says, and that was the onset of my um, my first panic attack. And so for me, my body always knows what it needs. Every wound I got as a mm-hmm. child, uh, I describe as a lead brick for the soul. So every wound that I got became a weight on my soul 
and was stored in my body as body memories. So as I went through life, you know, my intellect was having a ball. I've got an amazing intellect. But my soul and spirit were getting burdened and burdened and burdened until the day I had my panic attack. And then I let my intellect try and think my way out for 20 years. And it couldn't. I had to feel my way out. And it was by shutting my mind, listening to my heart, and letting my body release the, those trapped energies of my childhood abuse. It felt, yeah. once I'd healed the wounds of my childhood, which was um, a bit of an intellectual exercise, but on the physical side, just allow my body to release, shake, rattle, roll, swear, scream, shout, rant. I was living on my boat, so it didn't matter. You know, it's not the sort of thing you do in the supermarket. They'd lock you up. But I let my body release all that trauma, all those lead bricks. Thanks, that Bob. And that, that's it's a it's a great way to yeah just define self care like a process of just doing that that vent that vent opportunity. And yeah. it actually really oh, leads into my next my next I question was for you. Going to say, Bob, if there's if there's something that there's a question in what in your commentary to Nikki, that's probably what we're after at the moment. Um, while well, we've got Nikki and her her wisdom, but if if not, then let's yeah carry on with Nikki. Well, I really don't have questions because from where I'm coming from, I found all my own solutions within my own yeah. heart. So, yeah. so everybody definitely. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So do you mind if I just put a comment to that? I, I agree wholeheartedly that the answers are within ourselves. Um, and when you were talking, it, it re resonates with me. I do adult play therapy with a lot of my clients and it's about doing things that make you feel good so you can process your feelings like you would do with a kid. If a kid, if you're playing with Meccano, or you're playing with Lego, whatever you're doing, it, it brings about a, a sense of joy and connection and, and feeling. And so that really resonates with me. And so um, I'm turning your statement into a question that I'm addressing and that, yes, I, I agree, it is all within us. And a huge part of my work is assisting men to have that come out because not all men can do it by themselves. They yeah. need some assistance. Well, no man is an island. but Exactly. I'm a I seaplane. Fill, you know, I fill my day with activities that put me in the zone. So I'm so, almost in a constant state of bliss. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks. It's been Brilliant. great connecting with you. Thanks, Bob. Now, Nikki, my sort of was a good segue into, into my next question. And, and it sort of relates back to the last question that I asked you. Now, as a male with lived experience of suicide, I've got no drama connecting with men and some women who have a lived experience as well. But when it comes to females that have no lived experience of suicide, I really struggle to connect with them if I want to talk about my lived experience because I find there's often a lot of judgment and stigma that sits in that. And I've, I've had many conversations with men that are similar and sometimes it can be people who are their partners or their sisters or their mothers. I'm just wondering, is, is there any, any magic words or any way that you've learned to help men to communicate with women about their lived experience of suicide? I teach it in a way that I try to teach people to understand about my own lived experience of suicide. Mm -hmm. um, as somebody, and this is a term I don't particularly like, gets dubbed as high functioning um, with her mental health battles, my suicidality isn't easy to spot and it isn't easy to understand because I'm not, you know, the the textbook presentation. I'm not, as an example, you know, in bed, not haven't moved for weeks kind of situation or I'm not yelling and sobbing and, and presenting to ED. And so I, I teach and, well, I certainly teach, I guess. It's more this is how I do it, how would you do it kind of thing. I work in this collaborative approach of, can you liken it to something you know that your significant person has experienced? So one is I had a beautiful one from a lad who just uh, learned about menstrual cycles and he said, you know, when you get your really, really bad cramps and it feels like you can't move and you can't breathe, he's like, that's what my soul feels like and I want to die. And I was like, 
that's a really good way of trying to get someone else's brain to understand that you know you want your pain to end and so you are able to take some medication for it but sometimes that med doesn't always work and so here I am and I and I can't get any further either and so this is what my brain has gone to but I think also I always teach people you don't have to get something to acknowledge it exists I don't understand a lot of physics but I know it exists and I respect the people who do the physics, <laughs> you know? So it's like, it's not necessarily that you have to understand how their two plus two works. Just know they have a two plus two. Mm. And don't so, judge. Like, that just drives me insane. Sorry, JB, that just drives me insane. There is a lot of wacky stuff out there that should be judged harshly. Your battle with the dark and twisty void shouldn't be judged. Save your judgment for things that should be judged. Yeah. It's, a, it's just such a fundamental thing, isn't it, in supporting people that judgment just doesn't have a place. We might feel judgments. Uh, that's mm. one thing, but we need to try to manage that and be there to support people. So I'm, I'm wondering um, if, uh, in a way, I think Tyne has asked this question, this question but um, I'm going to ask it maybe a slightly different way. So as a woman, what works for you in supporting men? And, and are there particular things within that in terms of that we can maybe pass on to the women we work with or that we connect with who might be trying to support men? Uh, so I'm going to answer that in a couple of ways because <laughs> it's a bit different. For me, beginning and starting in incarcerated populations, being a five-foot-two blonde goes a long way. No one expects mm. to see a civilian five foot two blonde wandering around with the type of people that I did and that the way they look, right? That is, that works. There's a lot of um, mischief in being able to have me as your recovery coach when you have face tattoos and you're Jack and you're six four, right? It's funny to go to Woolworths like that. So that is a bit of a an, an in. Um, and the fact that I don't, can I swear on this? Yeah, okay. I'm a very we're not here to fuck spiders type of person. Like we're I'm Australian. We're we're gonna fuck around and find out, but we're gonna do it so that we don't go to prison or we don't harm anyone else. We're gonna learn stuff and we're gonna get in and I, I just don't beat around the bush about stuff. That resonates a lot with a lot of people when they think they're going into some sort of allied health environment. It's gonna become very, you know, hierarchical and very like, oh, you know better than me. And I'm like, no, I just read a lot of textbooks. You tell me, what are we doing? Um, and that sort of relatability really helps. Um, the way I teach women to relate to women, which is what makes me unique to those men that they don't care that I look different to them or they might look like, I'm going to use Liam because I know him outside of this, they might look like Liam and us being together doesn't look odd, right, or co comedic or anything like that, is you need to not show your fear, um, there is a rightful, right, fear in women about men, but you need to own that. That's not someone else's problem, right? And so in that, I mean, be aware of what you, your triggers are, what you find offensive versus moral injury versus psychologically damaging and traumatic and work on controlling that because the more control you have over yourself and your reactions, the better the other person is going to respond to you, particularly men. Because men, again, keeping in mind the cohort I work with, are naturally protective beings, as are women, but it manifests differently. And so if you are anxious and fearful, like your anxiety's gotten to the fear, not the, oh, I hope I'm a good counsellor or a good therapist or anything like that, like that fear-based anxiety, it will start to show you will start to accidentally project things like judgment and um, disregard and hurrying along sessions or whatever you're doing. And so it's really important to know yourself so it doesn't come across. And if you are working with men who scare you, whether physically or emotionally, build up skill sets so that you're in control of that situation. Um, one of the reasons I don't get uh, react normally as a lot of people say in threatening situations is because I've taken the time to train me physically to be able to physically remove myself from a situation um, I have also trained myself psychologically to handle that um, and done a lot of work like 
uh, training work as in, in professional development and a lot of personal work with personal uh, therapists to be able to handle that situation. Um, and so that's a real big thing that I teach women when they ask and they say they want to work with men. I'm like, okay, you're going to have to deal with about 90% of your anxiety um, because it it really impacts that barrier. And as a woman and a warning on this, as a woman who's worked with sex offenders, and high level men like that, it's really important to do so because you won't make therapeutic growth with somebody if you react to that in an unhelpful way. The same with working with victims, male victims. It's not the same as working with female victims. You need to be really aware of how you react to that because it is very difficult for the person you are trying to intervene with to be able to interact with you if you are putting off the vibes, if your energy's off, just to try and lighten that a little bit with a little bit of vibe. Um, and so that's what I do with that. And it doesn't work with everybody. Um, I'm not, per- I don't fit every man or every woman, but it's just, that's what I've learned and it's what I use and it's it's worked so far. And that's some <laughs> really good perspective. And I'd like to come back to some stuff you just touched on there, but Paul, we're going to pass over to you. If you can come off mute and you got the floor. Uh, I just wanted to ask Nikki too around that um, fear and anxiety. What if your fear is not of the person, but maybe the way they could act? If you've had previous experience and you've been on that edge with that person, like um, where they're ready to take their life, and you, mm. you, you're talking them off of that, or they have tried to take their life, and then you're doing first aid and everything, mm-hmm. how do you come back from that? You know to um, because that can impact who you are. Oh, yeah. You know, um, yeah. Uh, coming out the other side. Maybe you come through clean, but the, there's that trauma to about um, recovering from that because you know that it can happen any time or so. You might think everything's right. And, and um, yeah, I just, we talked about, you talked about anxiety and, and fear mm. with um, people. Um, when um you know you might be scared because they're bigger but what if the fear isn't because they're you know big or yeah the masculinity so but what yeah. they could actually when they're talking that that's something they could do and then the next person you're work, working with is talking similar and then your your thoughts are in that moment of yeah. with the person your thoughts are from, with the trauma that you've experienced with someone else Yeah, I love that you just asked me that, Paul, because this is something I'm a big advocate on. I'm going to answer this in two ways. The first way is as a organization or a service provider, you must put buffers in between appointments. You must have adequate staffing. You need this. As someone who was raised in private practice, this whole eight to 10 clients at 50 minutes with 10 minutes between is needs to be cut. Um, KPIs mean jack if your resources are being traumatized and then being told to recircle back to baseline in 10 minutes. It doesn't work. And we don't get to define what's traumatizing for people. It is or it isn't. People get to define that with how their brain responds to things. And so as someone who's been a lead in uh, as a manager and, and as a team leader for clinical and non-clinical support, it is something I am a pain in the ass about because it, it could be something as obvious and as loud as someone comes in, they're actively suicidal and you have to deal with that. And then your next client's actively suicidal. And then you're, and that's very clear that that's distressing, but it could also be the accumulation of what it's, you know, what if that client wasn't quite telling me the truth? What if I didn't quite register that person? What if I didn't quite assess, you know, and then that can build into a traumatic response. So it must be this supportive environment where people can tap out and say, I can't do another appointment today someone else needs to go in and you need to have it set up that your organization and your team know the clients, the clients know them, and we're doing as minimal impact on that therapeutic relationship. As a person, um, and what I do is, is I really rely on my mechanical brain um, and my very much, I have learnt as much as I can and I have tried as hard as I can to be as diverse as I can as as a helpful person, but I am only one human. And so I can only help another human as much as they are willing to let me. 
And so I really sit on the line that sits between duty of care and dignity of risk. And I have had clients die in my office in session because I uh, recess was not possible. And I have had clients go through assessment and, and, and then attempt later despite us doing everything we can and I've had them survive and I've had them not. I think it's really important for me that I keep connecting with that client after an attempt. I don't like to just drop them. Um, I don't agree with that. Some people have practice and, and evidence that says that that's beneficial, whatever. But my practice is if that client consents and wants to see me again, I will see them again because I think it's really important that we don't accidentally add in judgment and shame by saying, no, you attempted on my watch. I don't want to deal with you because I'm too scared. I really like to use it as a trust building thing going, okay, what happened that you couldn't ask for help or what failed or, or what didn't work to help you through this? What can we do more? Use it as a learning experience. And it is uncomfortable. I don't go in and, and do all this and come out and go, what do I look things? I'm like, whoa, and my soul hurts. And it's like the tips of my hair hurt. And I cry so much that Kleenex should give me shares. But like it's, you got to sit in the uncomfortableness of being wrong or not being the one that someone reached out to or whatever it is to learn and grow and and I'm not a wizard I wish I was but I'm not a wizard I can't save everybody but I can sure as hell advocate that it doesn't happen again does that answer your question Paul (laughs) amazing um yes it does Nikki but sometimes it's not you that's triggered the person it's someone else and they might and they might have um come to you and you know you might be with someone else and you give them the time but the they still think that's part of their choice and control. And, you know, sometimes you feel it's hard sitting with it. Just I've yes. been in the situation um, um, where someone else has triggered someone else. Uh, mm. The day's finished, everything's all right. Then I see someone on, on a railway station and what happened yeah. on the railway station um, was uh, um, traumatic to me, um, but um, I didn't know what was happening by the time it happened. And, um, and then uh, it's not the first time it's been a few times, but then I had, had to take a break from doing this sort of work for a little while. It wasn't that I I couldn't sit with the feelings. It's just, um, yeah. Same as like you said, you've had a a history and I've had a big history from childhood up. Oops. Yeah, I, I get what you mean now, Paul. And this is why as someone who um, supports people through peer supervision or as a lead or just as a person, I say, tell me absolutely everything in your life. I want to know your poop schedule. I want to know when you have a cup of coffee. I want to know everything in your life because as a group, right, we can all sit here and go, you just made a joke about, you know, nearly getting T-boned at Elwick Lights. That's a place in Tassie. Um, Elwick Lights. But that that would have really scared me. Are you sure you're okay? Because mm. sometimes we don't realise what hurts us. We don't mm. realise. Um, and I get like that too. People will say to me um, and my friends say to me, you're getting a little too dark and twisty. Like mm. you're a little too ominous and if it gets too bad they start using pop culture references and they'll be like you're feeling a little bit like a dementor right now which is out of harry potter Mm. or they're like you're a little bit too christina yang out of Grey's anatomy and it's that that is that is helpful for me because i can kind of start to get a gauge because i might think i'm fine and then i'm actually not on my basket case and i haven't noticed Mm. and so i think it's also it's not easy right i'm not perfect at it um and it it's really difficult and and I am a type of person that when I get hurt by something, I get angry. So when someone pushes on my grief around the loss I've had because of suicide in my life, I get passionate and I get angry. But I might not be like that in seven years. I might not be like that in 12 years. I might not like mm. be like that in six months. It might turn around into a different emotion. Mm. Um, and so, but no, I really do hear you because it is hard when it when it is that because you might just be going along on your Joe Blogs day and something happens and you're like, whoa. I suddenly have a psychological injury, mm. you know, yeah, and it, yeah. no one can really prepare for that. No. Like yeah. it, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'm moving forward. I've just done um, something that I, I, I'm dealing with in my own way because um, I have my own yeah. little experience 
you know, of of surviving, but and um, have some family experience and uh, just. Some, oh, thank you, thank you for thanks. sharing, Paul. Thank you. And thanks for the question, and we'll get to it a bit later on. But we do have a, a men's online safe space, which might be an opportunity for you to connect in and have some conversations with us at some point as well. If if you'd like some more support from men who have experienced a suicide. Thank you. I just um. JB, I'll throw to you, about. and then you can throw it. Yeah, I, I was going to say as well, um, Paul. If there are, yeah, I don't know what supports you've had or got, but I'm happy to share some things offline. If um, if you you know looking for some different uh, options to chat to people about some of that stuff, so I got some supports outside of work. That that wasn't the, it was the su supports that weren't in the work because. You know, they might just send you to somewhere like the um, telephone counsellor, you know, just to talk to. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. And then you have to um, figure it out yourself because and that's mm. where I went and found my own supports, but still what mm. wasn't always cool at work around the, you know, the trauma I was trying to deal with. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for sharing so much. So, Glenn, you've got your hand up there. Thanks, guys. Nikki, really good to see you. Um, Hi, Glenn. <laughs> I'm just interested, Nick, and I want to comment on your, your talking about um, getting people back and, and seeing people again after an attempt um, or after you know an, an episode. And, and we we sort of find at the moment, and we're struggling a little bit with our program. And, and as a peer worker, um, we're having a little bit of an issue with. If somebody under our care has, you know, an escalation, some of the, the the programs are really quick to sort of go. Look, they've had an escalation; they're too risky. We need to close them. Mm. Mm. Um, and and it's getting to the point at the moment where our team and me as peer worker and, and sitting down and talking that we'll actually fudge our notes into the system. And not report that that escalation, not record it as an escalation, because we're not going to battle all the time to have you know our our higher ups go look they're they're unstable. We need to close it. We need to get rid of them. So you know it it's an episode. It's and we had one recently where it wasn't. She had a, a really traumatic experience. It didn't lead to any suicidality or any thoughts of suicidality. It was a trauma episode that triggered it. Mm. Um, but our, you know, the the medical model will then call call that a escalation, and we need to close yeah. it because it's outside of the realm of our program. So we're getting to the point where we're just not, you know, we're not recording episodes properly, mm. so that we can keep going with them, we can keep working with them, we can keep that support going. Mm. Um, so I think there is that fear in that. I love. I love the fact that you said, you know, we, we bring them back in. We keep working with them. Yeah, um, I I have some pretty hefty opinions on that. Um, in that, and I, and a few of y'all have who have, have been, um, I guess, uh, blessed to uh, experience those opinions from me. Um, no, they are quite hefty. In that, when we create programs and when we do all these things, they end up in a business model. So even taking out health, taking out all of that, it becomes a business model. And what do business people want? We want no risk. We want no to low risk. That, but what is risk, mm. right? It's one of those things that's quite hard to define. And so when I talk about when we're doing parameters and program building and development and risk, and this is, is quite a, a thing I sit in on and I talk about, is that to minimise risk, you need to invest in adequate and quality training to your staff. If your staff, and we know this because we learn this from when things go to coroner's court, right? Thankfully, coroner's court hasn't been empty. It gets used all the time. And what do coroner court do? They look at your notes. They look at your documentation. They look at that you following your program parameters. Do you have a practice room? All of that stuff. And so is your staff doing that? Are you promoting and facilitating and collaborating with your staff? And I use the word facilitating because it's not enough to just say do this. You need to make sure they have adequate time. Do they have adequate resources? Does the system work? Yada, yada, yada. 
Because if you are at it, just like when we move into medical model and people die in medicine all the time or they get seriously injured or they get a worm taken out of their brain, which we've just seen in the news recently, everything is documented really quite clearly. And then that's what's investigated and people are interviewed if something goes really, really wrong. So why can't we do the same in community service, grassroots, et cetera, programs where people's uh, independence and rights are respected, but also we are protecting ourselves because we know when we're in the throes of grief, because we all have grief in our lives, we do want to blame someone. And with suicide, it's a lot harder because it's harder to find that blame. So of course, families and friends and that want answers. And that's why we have coroner's court. So it, I feel like if we make sure all of that documentation, all that systems are in place, business people who don't necessarily get what we do, start to understand how we use the systems and the processes if something does go wrong in our favour and learn from it. It seems to me that a big part of that whole question of risk is we actually need to take the approach of embracing risk as well as trying to mitigate it. Obviously, we need to mitigate it sometimes, but but actually risk is central to making progress in many things. Yeah, like the stock market. Mm. Not a, no one laughed at that. I'm not a finance person. That's meant to be <laughs> kind of funny. There we go. Oh. Thank you. That's a pity laugh I'll take. <laughs> it's all yours, Nikki. It's all yours. We've got a uh, great question, Glenn. And Liam, we'll come to you now. And then Gabe will come to you. Okay. Um, so I guess my question is because we've got this unique opportunity. Um, we get told as guys, you know, mates being mates, just talk to your mate. Um, and, you know, I, as, as Nikki knows, but I, I work in, you know, youth mental health and, and I'm very comfortable having these conversations in my role because there's safety in the in the role that I have. Um, but as someone observing men supporting men, what actually does seem to work when we're supporting actually just our loved ones and our mates like where men are actually just supporting other men like what have you found seems to work best or good approaches for us when we're supporting our friends uh every but it did take a lot of risks Bob, for people to get to the moon so i just saw the chat i i have a very me approach which is just ask them what's the worst that's going to happen they're going to laugh at you they're going to mock you you're going to find out your friend's not that good of a friend maybe it's going to open a dialogue the worst thing that's going to happen is you feel like you don't know what to say back um i say that to the younger males in my family when they were a wee bit younger than they are now and we're talking about sex and consent and all the fun things that they don't want you know if they're older cousin sibling type person to talk to them about and they get all embarrassed and that kind of makes a bit funny for me um is what's the worst that's going to happen is that you're going to feel uncomfortable but the best thing that can happen is you save a life and it might not be a stop from death but it might be that you save their quality of life their joy in life something to do with their life so just ask and the difficulty is, is your own resources, I think, whether that's how you feel about asking or, or what to do. And so that's why I am so loud about making resources really obvious. Like it's to the point where you can just say you're stalking my Instagram and it's on there. You know, you don't actually have to go and have it in your Google history or, or have it anywhere else. It's it's that and just being loud about it. And also like like it really is just down to that. What's the worst that's gonna happen? Like it really it's simple but not easy, but that is essentially what it is. Thanks, Gabrielle. You've got a question as well. Yeah, thanks. And nice to meet you, Nikki. Um nice to meet you too. I've heard some good things about you from Glenn. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, I had, yeah, that just made me think of another question, but I'll just quickly wrap them together. Um, the first one was around, you talked a lot about like communicating in creative ways and through activities and stuff with men and not always using words. Mm -hmm. And I guess wrapping into this stuff that um, we've been talking about with business models and just generally reaching men in rural and remote areas, we're just getting crunched mm. more and more to 
to do um, telehealth or, you know, like it's just, it's really hard. So I just wondered on your thoughts on that, on maybe any creative ideas to try and like, yeah, be creative around the limits of resources to actually do the, the activities that are needed, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm a little punchy with it. Again, yep. not being a finance person really works in my favour. I think I've started actively choosing to not learn about finance so I can keep this agenda that I have, which I will yeah. calculate the expense of the death of a man using a farmer as an example. Mm. And then I will tell, then I will use the budget they've given me for my resources to do outreach. And I'll be like, which one do you want to pay? Um, because, and I will count the flow on it. I will do, I will go I real like deep with this. Yeah. I will count the CO2 impact of that car and the impact of that multi generational family impacted by the death of that person. Because, and people say, oh, it's all about the money. It's actually all about the ability to conceptualize what you are telling somebody. Right. Mm-hmm. If you've never experienced suicide, how do you get some like how do you understand that feeling? And so it's it's like, okay, this is literally what it is. This is what it's gonna look like if we don't do this. And if we don't do and if we do it, we've only spent this much. So like it's not that bad on the theme of things. Yeah. Um, and so I really use that. But in terms of getting the data that beyond a, a quick survey is I will door knock. I will talk to Rural Alive and Well as an example. They're here in Tassie. Mm. Uh, they do a lot of work. I go, what what, do you, what are the feedback you're getting? What are you getting? What do you think your rurals need? Um, going to CWA, uh, really out of the ordinary, out of the uh, designed or purpose-based um, community supports. What are you hearing? What are you seeing? Collating that and coming back to government or funders or whoever you're going to and going, we actually have this data. Please give us a little bit of money to prove to you that we need a lot of money Mm. Um, because it's not a clear profit, this sort of work. It's very unclear. Um, You're not, you know, you're not giving 20 and making 40. You really need to be quite clear about it and you need to be emotive, but with hard data. Mm. which is where a lot of people go wrong. Like case studies are great. You definitely still need them. You need the stories, but you need to also put it into a hard, hard example. That mm. makes sense. But that's as yeah. creative as I get. And it doesn't always uh, work because if yeah. it did, I'd probably have about eight programs funded by now. <laughs> no, it's revolutionized Tasmania. But, uh, yeah. that, it, it helps. It motivates me. Um, and that I other part of the question. Yeah. I, it kind of wraps into that. It's about um, we've lost some men. Um, in the region who you know never and I guess the the wording that you you know we're given is oh they've never they never got contact with the system or whatever you know and then that's seen as a I mean sometimes I feel like that's almost put out as a failure on that man's part Um, but yeah I'm interested to hear your opinion on what we can do better to to reach those men who just you know that the system's not working for them that they don't want to engage in any thing because it's not yeah I don't know yeah I I get a little philosophical and go well what is the system obviously I know what the system is but what is the system and so this is where I get into the if everybody every I'm not quite old enough to remember this but I know a lot of people talked about it when CPR became a thing Right, yeah. everybody had to learn it. The Wiggles created a song. The Hooli Doolies created the song. Beatles probably created a song about doing the CPR, and it became this thing that everybody now, if they haven't done a first aid course, they have a concept of how to do CPR. It's seen everywhere on television. It's used in Home and Away constantly. Like it's something that's become the norm is how to do chest compressions. I think being able to say to somebody, "Hey," you have been behaving differently or I'm just worried or I'm just asking so I feel better about myself, whatever the motivation is, has the skill to go, are you okay? What's going on? And then connect into the system like Mm. or into something that, that exists, right? And I think it's really important to have the diversity of programs and all of that, but I think it's more important to get right down to everybody to get to a CPR level of just a basic, mm. you good? No, perf. We're going to do this. Like, and by perf, I mean it's like it's just fine. It's just what you do. It's mm. the same as you know that greeting of how are you? Yeah, good. No one's actually 
processing you asking them how you are it's a greeting but it just becomes that norm and and that's how we get the men that we're missing is we make it normal because they will talk that's it's not it's a bit of a myth that you know if you go out to a old man river who lives in the middle of nowhere mm. and rumored to not seen anybody for years and you go hey fred how you doing that fred's just not going to talk to you like fred is going to talk to you oh, you yeah. have to be willing to listen mm. and actually take it in and listen to what fred wants if fred mm. doesn't want to leave his arm and fred wants to do what fred wants to do then let's help fred do fred fred things without hurting fred like mm. it's not rocket science really but but it's right. difficult because we everybody wants this amazing answer and i don't really think there is one except basic human stuff yeah mm. it's a good answer <laughs> yeah oh, thank, you. thank you can i can i um push us into a slightly different space and ask a question around what do you think we need to do um or how do we get government and policy people to think differently about working with men and supporting men? Oh, that's a big question, JB. Um, well, if you could just false answer that in the next five minutes and we can start working on it, that'd be great. Yeah, just- I know, right? Just solve the world <laughs> problems in one question. Um, look, I, I think government are listening. I just don't think they're reproducing in a way that makes us happy. Um, I got asked, I get asked often if I'm going to go into politics. The resounding answer is no. Um, I would get cancelled in a heartbeat. Um, Also, my head would look bad on a giant poster. But I think the politicians that we have are listening. And I say this because I was on the way back from the National Suicide Prevention. I got it wrong In, in May in Canberra. And I was sitting in the aeroplane waiting to take, like get off in Hobart Airport. And I got the generated text message from our local Labor candidate and um, being all like, is there any issues? We have an election tomorrow. And I was like, thanks for the reminder because I would have forgotten to vote um, because I'm terrible. And I would have been like, I I was like, great. And I just text back and went, yeah, I've just finished a national suicide prevention conference. I'd love to talk to you about male suicidality in Tasmania. Met with me a week later. And listen to me ramble on a lot less structured than this because I'm not good with just an open. What do you want from me? I'm like a couple of gazillion dollars to solve the world. I don't really know. And they are listening and it has been taken on and it is being implemented. Um, not just from me. I'm not a world saver, but it, they are listening. I think the difficulty we have is, is the handling of the information. We go from a program manager to a state manager to then it branches one funder wants one thing another funder wants another thing if it's state they want this if it's feds they want this if it's feds through an organ and, and they get to and then and then there's like 80 other levels and then you have like the minister or something and it's and you've got to go through a couple of sec- secretaries and it's all very it's changed every single time and so i think for communication of information because we have a wealth of it is that we need to stop bluffing around we need to stop fucking spiders and we need to just streamline it. Like it just needs to straight up. It might be that someone is reading 40 pages from each little program and we have like hundreds and hundreds of them across the country. Yeah, that's really annoying. Hire assistants to read them for you. But, you know, it just needs to stop getting watered down. And we see this when we we have conversations with wonderful people like the Minister for Mental Health, when we talk to Sarah Hawke, when we talk to high-level anybody, we talk to CEOs of organisations that run these programs, that they're like, I don't know what's happening because their reports get watered down or it's not clear or it's not, you know, that direct kind of conversation. And I think we need to talk to men and let men decide what men want. Um, I get, I have been asked recently uh, what male behaviour is. How do I define a man? And I went, I don't. A man tells me he's a man. A man tells me what a male behaviour is. It, that would be the equivalent of me asking a man to define a woman. It, it's whatever it is. And so this vague but specific needs to be done. And a lot of new programs that are coming out are vaguely specific, as in their criteria is suicide crises, suicide attempt, wants help, <laughs> you know, and it it leads so that tenders and, and the providers 
go to their communities and go to their cohorts and go, what do you actually need, right? What do you need to recover from those three things? Like, what what do you need Um, versus us dictating what is need? That's the medical model. And even the medical model has a lot of choice and control in it nowadays. And so, yeah, in summary, ask men. (laughs) That's a pretty good summary indeed to to ask people and gauge their lived experience. Yeah, and also but expand on that to actually do it. Don't just go, what do you need? And then do the opposite. And then be like, why is it working? And it's like, well, because they said they wanted potato cakes or scallops or whatever you mainlanders call them. And you gave them hash browns. And sure, it's got potato in it, but they're very different. <laughs> Let's just actually listen to what is needed and then try to give it. We can't fit everyone. Every Like the potato cake thing I just did, everyone has a different name for it, but it still needs to be done. And if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. At least you tried. Definitely. Now, Nikki, you've covered a lot tonight and you've touched on some pretty big topics. And one of them, which I wanted to get into, but we don't have time, was around the work that you do with sex offenders. But with with the diversity of your work and your own lived experience, and I know that through this year, like you and I have both sort of had our own ups and down moments. What I want to come to at the moment is self-care and how you manage or how you how you prepare to manage and sometimes how you react to when life doesn't seem to go that way for you and you find yourself needing to to get yourself out of a certain moment. What's the process look like for you and, and how do you prevent it? I really wish that I could say something really on like brands being like I use positive psychology and mindfulness and I don't I am such a hot mess it's it's amazing I I function to be honest um but in a really groovy way so I I like to keep busy because my brain thinks a lot (laughs) and if I'm not entertaining at least four channels of it 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 it's it's very bad up in here and so I like to feel like I'm doing different levels of doing. So I work some pretty psychologically draining and damaging roles uh, that are quite uh, difficult on the good old noggin. But I balance that by working in suicide prevention, which to some people are like, that's another type of trauma. I'm like, yes, but different type. And so I like to make sure I'm engaged with a lot of different things that make me feel like I'm being productive. And I like to fuel my emotions into, channel my emotions into a fuel line. So if I am feeling like I need to process and I need to feel and I just need to have that happen, I um, I just saw your message, Graham. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, take care of yourself. Um, it's about I will just watch Gilmore Girls or sit in a beanbag or I'll go and hang out with my family and listen to them argue over car parts and then stuff uh, or who's put the canopy on or where the car keys are um, or I'll draw and I'll do things that just are very floaty and don't really have a purpose. Uh, I'll throw myself into work. I like to volunteer for charities and help them further their mission um, in life and all my charities happen to be male-based. I latch on to people that are like-minded. So just to give a shout out to Diane and JB and Glenn, I have latched onto them since meeting them because they bring me such counterbalance to my spite, which I used to drive me a little bit. Like when I get really downtrodden, I'm like, no, I must spite the people that are failing us. Like I must, no, I will win. I will beat them. And, and that balances that kind of negative into a positive drive into this. Yes, other people are doing it too and with such grace and such good humor and such understanding that I'm like yes thank you thank you for all that you do and it just brings me such um warm and toasty feelings that I can connect to people like that all over the the country Tassie's is quite small it's quite hard to find like-minded people here with a population of half a mil um and I also Mm -hmm. like to just take the simple things like my family members are the most gorgeous men you will meet. 
Like my uncle is the funniest guy and the biggest inspiration to me. He became a single dad very suddenly when his wife passed away, my aunt. And he is and they he became a single dad in an era in Tassie that you just you weren't a single dad. You know, you you just dads couldn't raise kids. It, it, and it, it was only, you know, 10 years ago, but it still the amount of vitriol I heard about him and his his uh conviction and his stamina when he was grieving such a so horrible and raising two beautiful young boys, it just it brings me so much just warmth and love for him that he was able to do that. My dad is the most unassumingly strong person. Andrew was his son and and he had to deal with a very grieving me and, and, and the loss of his son and all the complexities surrounding that. And to see him exist with a, a daughter, he doesn't always understand, but he loves unconditionally. Let's ramble on about things. He's just like, it's a lot of English, but God, I love you. And that just simplicity um, my two cousins, my my uncle's children, who are like brothers um, to me, almost like my own children. I love them that much. They just are so gorgeously male, <laughs> and so just it's just that simplistic joy of just sitting in the my God, it's another day, and you're still alive, and I God, I love you for it. Like it's just that Beautiful. sort of stuff. So those those um, just soul uh, deep rooted connections are so. Uh, so beautiful to hear about and obviously so important. Um, final question before we start to wrap things up. Um, it's a beauty from Tynan. Um, but what's your proudest moment in the work that you've done? Oh, my God. Um, I can imagine there's a lot. So, oh. sorry, it's singular. No, I... I'm trying not to do that thing where I just put things in genres <laughs> and go, my proudest moment of this genre was this. Um, I'm pretty proud of being uh, invited to here, to be honest, to talk in a very casual way where we're all very dynamic backgrounds and dynamic experiences is very um, pride inducing, to be honest. Um, but I think my overarching kind of pride moment comes from when I, I can get people to start changing their way of thinking and perceiving men as men and as women. So when I can get people to see suicide as not a weakness um, and as something that happens and we can intervene on that, that, that change I think when I'm sitting in meetings and I see the light bulb start to flicker on I'm like yes we did it um I think that's what fills me with the most amount of pride that the tenacity actually pays off great great response and I just want to honor you and thank you for joining us tonight it's been a pleasure to have you and really just wish you all the best with your journey I've been privileged to hear many other aspects of your lived experience. And I know that through that, your tenacity and your ability to just get on and do it is really going to be a key driver for your success in the future. And yeah, we just, I'm sure that you've got a great future ahead of you and the impact you're going to have is going to be long lasting and quite more significant in in the world of suicide prevention. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Nikki. Thank you yeah. so much for having me. And thank you for saying something so nice. I'm a bit misty now. Thanks, Simon. <laughs>